This morning we are going to read from four different um, Bible readings. We'll start off with Romans 9, verse 6 to 13. Now it is not as though the word of God has failed, because not all who are descendant from Israel are Israel. Neither is it the case that all of Abram's children are his descendants. On the contrary, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. That is... It is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but the children of the promise are considered to be the offspring. For this is the statement of the promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah will have a son. And not only that, but Rebekah conceived children through one man, our father Isaac. For though her sons had not been born yet or done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose according to election might stand. Not from works, but from the one who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, I have loved Jacob, but I've hated Esau. Then Ephesians 1, verses 4 to 5. For he has chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Romans 8, verses 28 to 30. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called, And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Finishing with John 6, verses 37 to 40. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him, so who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So we're going to be looking at the next of our head series of um, of our head, heart, and holy hands. Uh, sorry, head, heart, hands, and holy worship series. And um, in the in the head part of that, we've been looking at what do, makes us distinct as Reformed Christians, and we've been working through you know the sort of famous acronym TULIP. And last time we looked at total depravity, and today we're going to be looking at unconditional election. So the U of the of the tulip. So we saw that uh, in, under total depravity, we saw that it, we are actually totally unable to choose to follow God if He doesn't first change our hearts to follow Him. That is, our hearts are deceptive and beyond uh, beyond cure, as Jeremiah says. Who can understand it? And so. Ever since the fall, ever since sin entered into the hearts of humanity, we, uh, we have been on a continual quest to reject God uh, and, to, and, we, and we've been in this perpetual state of, uh, of not wanting to follow God. That's the doctrine of total depravity. It, it reminds us that there is nothing we can do to choose God without God first choosing us and changing our hearts and us then responding to His grace. Now, if, as we saw, that total depravity is true, it must then mean that God elects us uh, when he chooses for himself a people, he does so unconditionally. That's the doctrine of uh, of unconditional election. Now, I think when you talk about doctrine sermons, uh, it's helpful to use a um, an image to help us think through it, and I think uh, the doctrine of total election—sorry, oh, unconditional election—is a little bit like a gemstone that you dig up from the ground. Uh, it's it's 
when you see it at first, it's rough and it's messy and it's maybe covered in dust and it's not really particularly beautiful. But I'm going to try and do this morning is present it in a way by looking at three different facets to this gemstone and perhaps you will see the beauty actually of this deep doctrinal truth. The first thing we're going to look at is just defining it. We have to understand unconditional election. What does the Bible actually say? And so, so what is unconditional election? Well, it's the doctrine that God chose certain people whom he would save by faith through Jesus. Now, this is a choice that God has made uh, without anything that people could do. So whether they were going to be morally good or morally bad is irrelevant to God's choice of people because we are all morally bad, right? If, if total depravity is true, we're all morally bad. And so God chooses us not, not based on whether we're going to be good or bad. Whether they were going to be wicked or kind or born into families where uh, you know, godly morals were brought up or, uh, or not is immaterial. The choice that God makes of us is completely independent of the character of the person whom God chooses. It is entirely based on his own sovereign will and it has nothing to do with us. And this is a choice that God made before the world was ever created. Kind of like God within, uh, within the triune uh, Godhead had this discussion and they decided um, before the universe was created... God, the Father, Son and Spirit knew that if they created the world, they would give people free will. He would give people free will. It's hard to talk about the Trinity and the different persons without getting the uh, the, the pronouns wrong. But then that's our society today anyway. Um, So God, the Father, Son and Spirit, each person is deciding that they would give people free will and eventually, because of that, humanity would rebel. And that the son would ultimately be sacrificed to redeem these people. But having decided that, God decides before the world was ever created which of the people he would graciously choose for himself from all walks of life, from all generations, with all different character traits and from all different races. And this is crucial because it means that our decision uh, to follow God is not based on our spiritual or moral character. You see, God chose sinners, people who could not do anything good in and of themselves. They were, we are, totally depraved. And without God's intervention in our lives, none, would, none of us would ever choose to love him or choose to follow him. And so the choice that God makes, even before the world was created, is made not because God looks into the future and saw that if Jesus was offered to someone, these people would respond and those people wouldn't, so he elects the ones that would have responded anyway. Now, unconditional election specifically teaches that God chooses to elect people um, and that his choice in election causes us to respond. It's not the other way around. So our election is unconditional. It does not depend on any condition in us. That's what what unconditional election is as an idea. But does the Bible actually teach it? Well, let's have a look. Uh, Let's think, for example, in Ephesians uh, 1 verses 4 to 5. You can stick that up, Isaac. That would be helpful. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now just leave that up for a moment. So what do we see here? Here we learn when it was that God made the decision to choose. It was before he chose us, before the foundation of the world. Now why did he choose us? What was his purpose? For us to be holy and blameless before him. You see... Our holiness before God flows from God's choice. Our ability to respond to God depends on God first choosing us. We are chosen to be his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. And on what basis does he make the, the, the election choice? Purely out of his own good pleasure and will. The Bible does not teach that God looked into the future and saw who would respond to him uh, and therefore he chooses those people. It says here that God makes the choice of us and because he's made us uh, the choice of us, we are then going to be these holy 
and blameless people. At least that's what it says in Ephesians 1. In John chapter 6, verse 37 to 40, uh, again, if you have that, um, everyone the Father gives me will come to me. So everyone whom the Father gives me, everyone who's been chosen will come to me. This is to Jesus. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. For I've come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those that he has given me, but would raise them up on the last day. Now here Jesus is referencing that conversation that happens between Father, Son and Spirit before the world was created. Those whom the Father chose, he would give to his Son. They cannot be lost. Everyone the Father gives to me, says Jesus, will come to me. And so whether we come to Jesus or not actually ultimately depends on the Father's will. The Father gives the people to his Son and then they come to him and because they come to him they cannot be cast out. That's the order of things. But there is a little bit of a problem with the Romans passage, isn't there? So if you flip over to Romans 8 verse 28 to 30. We know all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And now this is the tricky part. For those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, so that he would be the firstborn amongst uh, many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he called. And those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Now we normally quote verse 28 because it gives us great assurance that when bad things happen to us, ultimately they work out to God. But we don't often go to the next verse, do we? Those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. So what does it mean that God foreknew people? It sounds a bit like God looks into the future to look to see who would respond to him, doesn't it? But unconditional election specifically is not that idea. So... We have to wrestle with this. So it seems like he's saying that, those, that he looked forward and looked to see who would respond to him. And if we did, then he would proceed to predestine, to save, to call, to justify and glorify. But that is to misunderstand what Paul means here when he says that God foreknew people. Now this is getting a bit technical, but bear with me for a minute. The type of foreknowledge that Paul refers to here is not God's ability to predict the future. This is a relational knowledge. It's kind of like the knowledge of a parent to a child saying, you know, I know Reuben, I know how he's going to act because he's my son. I have a relational understanding of who this child is. If you haven't met someone, you don't know them. Once you've met them, you've spent some time with them, you know them. It's that kind of knowledge. And it is in this sense that Jesus says in Matthew uh, 7 that, um, that he will say one day, he will announce to them, Depart from me, you lawbreakers, because I never knew you. It is a personal relationship with God that gives God this kind of foreknowledge. It's a relational knowledge. Now, the thing with knowing a person is, the, no, the more deeply you know them, the more deeply you love them. So consider a conflict situation. Let's say someone does something uh, to you, to hurt you, and you don't really know them. To try and understand why they might do something like that, uh, we tend to reduce that person to a single thing. We, we take a complex human being and we go, oh, well, they must have had a bad upbringing or whatever the case may be. And we, can, we kind of uh, put them in a box because we don't really know them. But the more deeply we know someone, the more we think, oh, well, I can forgive the person for that because I know where they're coming from. I know their background. I know how they think. I can see why they would have taken that kind of action. That's the type of knowledge that we're talking about here. And so what Paul is basically saying is that God already knew the elect deeply, personally, before the world was ever created. And we don't understand how that works, but that's what it's saying. And so he elects the people because he has a relationship with them through Jesus. One scholar puts it this way, says, Such foreknowledge likewise refers most often not merely to God's factual knowledge of future affairs, but it is God's prior disposition 
to relate and to favor and to know certain persons. But friends, that's exactly what's involved in salvation anyway. It is to have a deep relationship with God through Jesus, isn't it? And so we can't claim that God looked into the future to see if we would respond to him and then chose to have a relationship with him, uh, with us on, the, on that basis. Now what Romans is teaching is that God has this deep relational knowledge with us first and so predestines us to be saved so that we can respond to his call. That's what unconditional election is all about. God knows us deeply and wants a relationship with us and so he chooses us to be these holy and blameless people. And that's what Paul wants us to understand. Theology part out of the way. How does this apply to us? I think it applies to us in two different ways. Firstly, uh, the Bible gives us great examples of people who were wicked people who were elect by God and therefore uh, changed their lives radically. The first is the story of Mary Magdalene. She, she's this woman that uh, you know, followed Jesus. Um, she had seven, seven demons. She was deeply in bondage to Satan and the demonic world. And yet when, Jesus, when she meets Jesus, uh, she is radically transformed. But she had no capacity of her own free will to choose God. And maybe we can feel a bit like that sometimes. You know, maybe we can feel trapped in our circumstances where sin has such a deep grip on our hearts that we can't seem to escape. Do you really want to believe that your salvation is dependent on your ability to choose God? If that's your situation... Do you really want to entrust your salvation to yourself if you're in that box? Isn't it much better that it doesn't depend on us but depends on God's sovereign choice? Because we cannot save ourselves. Mary Magdalene was unconditionally chosen because she could not choose for herself and the same is true of us. Secondly, of course, is the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul was an interesting person because he hunted down Christians with zeal. His zeal was unmatched. His fervor in their death was unparalleled. He would later go on to call himself the chief of all sinners. And yet, this person who was so violently and passionately opposed to Christianity, God elected and adopted as his son. And his encounter with Christ Jesus so radically changed him from being a persecutor to being totally willing to being persecuted. And ultimately, he would be executed for his faith. He would preach from town to town and finally would appear before Caesar, the emperor of the Roman world. But do you really want to think that this persecutor would have chosen to follow God? That he would have earnestly sought Jesus to change his heart? That he would have wanted to become a Christian? Of course not. But again, it's a good thing that our election doesn't depend on us. Because without unconditional election, we wouldn't have half of the New Testament. Because Paul would not have become a Christian. Without unconditional election, we would have never heard those beautiful words of, of Paul in Ephesians 2, where he said, You are saved by grace through faith. It is not from yourself. It is God's gift. We would miss all of that because of some silly, prideful notion that there was something good still in us that would have chosen God if God had not changed our hearts. But praise be to God that our election is not conditional on who we are. And so where does this leave us? I think it leaves us with three responses. The first and most obvious is humility. Without unconditional election, we, there would be no need for us to come to God with humility, to fall on our knees. If we were elected not by God's sovereign choice but by our works, then there is no need for us to be humble before God because God has to accept us because of how good we are. But unconditional election puts us right back where we belong, on our knees in gratitude. When we acknowledge that our salvation is based solely on God's grace, 
we have to admit that we ain't all that. And that might be hard for us to do. But that's what's necessary for a relationship with God. Unconditional election reminds us that we are broken and undeserving sinners. And in humility we need to turn to God. That's the first thing. Secondly, we can have confidence that we won't be lost. Because let's face it, the Christian journey, the human journey is a bumpy one. We may well believe in Jesus strongly, but we wander. Our hearts chase after our own glory, our own desires, our own pleasures, even when we know that God wants something different for us. And it can sometimes feel that the darkness that we are in is so deep that we can't possibly get out of it. But do you see the assumption that lives underneath that? Is that our salvation depends on us. But when we are set free in Christ, we are, that happens because God elected us. God chose us, not because of our own strength. So that means that we cannot be lost, even though we are going through a difficult part. Because God's purpose in our election cannot be thwarted. Neither height nor depth, nor angels, nor demons, nor principalities or powers or anything else in all of creation can snatch you from God's hand. And I think that gives us great confidence while we struggle in sin. And then the last thing is confidence in evangelism. Now, sometimes we forget we forget this, but if unconditional election is true, then we can be very confident when we share the gospel with other people. We can preach the gospel boldly because we know that it will be effective for all whom God has called. Now, God may not have called everyone with whom we share the gospel. That's true. But if someone with whom we are sharing the gospel has been called by God, is elect, we can be 100% certain that the gospel message will take root in that person's heart. The seed that you sow will grow. You may never see it. But God will change that person through your words and you will see them in the future kingdom. Now, we might not be good with words, we might not have the most powerful arguments, we might not have the right theological terms, but thankfully, that person's salvation also doesn't depend on you. It depends on God's unconditional election. We just need to be faithful to the calling which God has given us. And when we do that, we can trust that the gospel will take root in every heart that has been elected by God. And I think that's rather wonderful. And so that is the gemstone of unconditional election. You know, it's a doctrine that the Bible holds up as, as absolutely true. We've looked at that angle that taught us in Scripture that God chooses us first and we respond, and it's not the other way around. We saw some beautiful pictures of how that actually works practically in people's lives, the lives of Mary Magdalene, of Paul. And there would be hundreds of testimonies of people that have been radically changed by God. And it gives us these three really practical applications to our lives. It drives us to humility, gives us strong confidence in our faith, even when we're going through difficult times. And it has evangelistic implications for us. And I think when we view this doctrine, this gemstone, and polish it from these three sides, I think it's quite a beautiful thing. And maybe you agree. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you that um, you give us deep theological truths that are beautiful and actually have real practical application to us. And so we thank you that we uh, come before you not as people who are good in and of ourselves. We recognize that we are in fact totally depraved and we need you to change our hearts before we can ever respond to you. Yes, we are responsible for responding to you, but you need to call us first. And so we thank you for the practical uh, application that has to our lives. It helps us to be humble, Lord, and we thank you for that. It teaches us um, uh, to reach out to people with great confidence, and it gives us assurance in all the times of our lives when we go through difficult times. And we praise you that you give us such a solid and firm foundation of our faith. And so we praise you for this and we pray that you will drive this deep into our hearts this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.